Yeah, I've got a couple of different uh, words that I've uh, introduced here. Um, so in a conference about digital capabilities and, and uh, digital literacies, um, I thought we'd have a think about what digital scholarship might be. But I'm going to talk to you about my passion, which is um, information literacy and how we can uh, kind of link all these literacies up together. And as Fiona says, um, I've been working in this area, running a program for 10 years, so I'm going to kind of try to bring this um, to kind of relate to some of my practical experiences in this area. Um, I think as to start off, I'll just kind of tell you a little bit of a story, and I, I don't know if there's anybody here um, who um, ever attended a conference back in around 2002, 2003. It was in Glasgow, and it was called ELIT, um, and it was uh, bringing to Fiona... It w and Joe, we've got a couple of people who were there. The idea of this conference was to bring together uh, people interested in IT literacy, information literacy, um, and e-learning, and to hold a conference. And um, this picture kind of nicely illustrates kind of what was going on at that conference, to be honest. It was a bit like a wedding you go to, where all the friends of the groom, sort of who knew him from school, talk to each other, all the family talk to each other, and kind of there's not an awful lot of mixing going on. So we had a lot of librarians talking to each other at the ELIT conference. We had a lot of IT people talking to each other. We had a lot of e-learning people kind of floating around in the middle. And I think, um, for me, I've been working in this kind of um, interest, interesting space where I sort of sit between library, IT, e-learning for, for more than 10 years. And I think that terminology has kind of been one of the biggest barriers to why we're not really talking together and working together and collaborating more. Um, and so, you know, I think what I would say is that we do need to really think about, and we've heard quite a bit about this at this conference, we do need to think about language, but we also need to stop trying to put things in boxes and stop trying to work out which of those containers is the bigger term. So is it digital literacy? Is it information literacy? Is it academic literacies? Where, where, whoever you go to talk to, their literacy will be the, the, the container term that everything else fits into. If you talk to somebody in the, the media and communication field, it's all about media literacy. Essentially, what we're talking about is a kind of a Venn diagram where everything overlaps. There is a huge range of these literacies, competences, skills, scholarship, all this kind of thing. And I, I think that what we should be really focusing on are kind of the core abilities that we want people to be able to do. So whether we're calling them, we have in the digital literacy field, we have the JISC model, we have a model I've developed, I'll say some more about that in a moment. We have uh, various, various digital literacy models. Are we talking about the same thing here? Can we kind of all agree on some kind of common um, areas? But we've got everybody kind of trying to get in on this field of digital skills, digital literacy. We've even got the banks. We've got Barclays with their digital eagles. Everybody's decided that this is a really key thing, that people need digital abilities. But, but what do we mean? Do we mean that they can just go online to pay some bills, to do online banking? Or do we mean the kind of higher order skills? I think, I think that's what we mean. Um, and I do, I go back to the GISC def definition. I think this is a really helpful definition because I think it is about the capability someone needs to live, to learn and to work. And I, and I think it, it, it is very helpful. But I, I do think that it can be sometimes quite div divisive with this idea that if we're talking about students, we're going to call it literacy. If we're talking about staff, we're going to call it a capability. We're kind of all working in, in HE, so should we be thinking about this as something that's related to scholarship and, and definitely something that relates to critical abilities, critical literacies? I, um, this is why I, this, as I say, this, my passion is kind of information literacy, and uh, UNESCO have recognised this more than 10 years ago. Um, the phrase has actually been around for over 40 years. It's, it's used very widely by librarians, but what I've sat, found when I talk to people who are not librarians is that they have an understanding of this term in a very, very narrow sort of sense. They believe it's just about helping people find information. Actually, read, read the Alexandra Pro Proclamation. This is really powerful stuff. It's, it's basically saying this is, this is a human right. This is something that promotes social inclusion. And this is why I think that actually information literacy is one of the terms that we should really be focusing on. 
The work I did five years ago, I worked with uh, Emma Coonan, and we were spending a lot of time thinking about what were these critical abilities that undergraduate students would need for the future to set them up for life. We ended up using the term information literacy, but whatever we called it, we came up with kind of aspects that we felt were really important. We wanted to develop a model that was learner-centred. We wanted to do something that really helped students become independent learners so that they were self-sufficient but that kind of recognized that people were at lots and lots of different levels um, we had things in there um, around finding and evaluating information but presenting synthesizing being able to kind of go out into the world and use information these were all really important things but what is missing from this model we didn't have a digital literacy strand what we thought and we spent quite a bit of time thinking about this was that actually was, was digital really the, the kind of key thing that we wanted to get across. Not because it wasn't important, we felt it was so pervasive, actually digital just featured in all those other abilities. I do think there are some uh, benefits to thinking about digital though, because I think it is an opportunity. It's, a, it's something the government have recognised, it's kind of a cool sexy term to be talking about this, it's linked to the economy, it's linked to kind of big businesses and, and a lot of companies are recognising that digital is an opportunity. But I think really what we need to be also recognising is, as Sue was talking about, we have a lot of people who don't want to engage with technology, who don't know how to use it effectively and we should be thinking about critical digital literacy. So we, we really should be thinking about when we should use technology, when we shouldn't use it. If you have a look, there was a, a recent uh, article in Inside Higher Education from an MIT study that the, the kind of, the, the, uh, it was really saying ban the laptop, you know, that, that students learn much better when they leave their laptop in their bag. And there were a lot of uh, colleagues at my institution who were delighted to read that. It kind of vindicated them for not liking technology and, and not doing Twitter and not going online and not using the VLE. And I think we do have to recognise that as Sue's been talking about, the whole digital natives idea is, is another potential problem. So we know they don't exist, but the rhetoric has, has kind of really stuck, as Sue says. There are many, many uh, academics I talk to who genuinely believe that their students do not need any help from them in using technology because they're all on Facebook. And they all, that, that will translate into them being able to use technology in a scholarly way. And, and to kind of really make the point that just because students are online does not equate to them being able to use technology in the most effective way is, is so important. It's so important to have those discussions. Um, I like to like the visitors and residents model. Um, one of the things I particularly like about this is that I think that there is a, a different online spaces and we behave differently in those. So the way I behave in Facebook online is quite different to how I behave when I log into my online bank. So I would say I'm much more of a kind of visitor when I go into certain spaces, maybe like LinkedIn, like my online bank, maybe like the VLE, than I am when I go onto Twitter, when I go onto the spaces that I use regularly. So I think it's also, it's not just about people having differences in online engagement generally, it will vary quite dramatically across the, uh, the platforms they use. And I'm really looking forward to using this with some of my students in a week or so's time. So I'm going to kind of return to, to the kind of main thing of what have I learned from running digital literacy programs, mainly aimed at staff, I have to say, for the last uh, 11 years or so at LSE. So I start off with this idea that uh, back in 2005, I, I, I think that digital literacy might be a good idea. I'm, I'm on this pretend horse, basically. I've talked to a couple of academics. I've discovered that we don't run training programs for them. We, we teach them how to use the VLE, but we don't run uh, courses in areas that will help them use technology better for their research. So I kind of make up a program. With, I call it digital literacy, and 
Effectively, now, 11 years later, digital literacy is a real horse. It's kind of running at LSE. It came out of an idea I had that there were gaps. There were areas where we just weren't teaching our academics. And I, I have to say, I can't really ride a horse. I'm still learning quite a lot. Um, but I, I do think that sometimes pretending and, and kind of just setting something up and experimenting is one of the key messages that I would give. And, and this is now, you look on the LSE website, we have information about the programmes that we run, we have uh, workshops running every term for staff and in a wide range of different areas. Um, and digital literacy has become uh, a reality. And, and in fact, from starting out with something that we were aiming at staff, it, it's actually ended up with a programme of digital literacy ambassadors that students are very engaged with. So we've, we've kind of really, um, you know, I think kind of got on the horse and, and started uh, uh, running here. Um, what works, though? I thought it would be useful to kind of think a bit about this. One of the things that... Um, we found particularly effective is collaboration. So there is not one department that could teach digital literacy at LSE. This is uh, some of my colleagues from the, the library and from our learning technology department. It's very important that we collaborate on these topics. And I think it's very important that these staff work together so that they develop a shared understanding of how you teach somebody to better manage information. What, what could a librarian bring to that? What could a learning technologist bring to that to kind of combine the strengths that they have? I, I try not to overmanage the program, so I let them come up with ideas of how they're going to do the courses, what, what works is, is kind of down to them, and bringing in new staff as well who are enthusiastic, who've got an idea, who've learnt about an app and say, I think this might make a good program, let's, let's try it out but also to be prepared to, to just kind of realise when something's not working. So we had a, a, a course I developed, I thought it's a fantastic course for our staff about how to use images in their teaching. We ran it probably for about three or four years. We never got more than two or three people wanting to come. I know everybody uses images in teaching, but nobody would come on a workshop. So eventually we decided this, this needs to be taught, but it needs to be kind of integrated into another uh, program that somebody might come along to. So it's, we have a wider session that's all about using digital media. There's a little bit in there about images. Um, so it's kind of, I think, being flexible with this program, trying things out. What doesn't work? Um, I think scared cats, um, <laughs> kind of trying to uh, horrify people. So um, I, I think that some of the um, programs we run, we, we had to think very carefully about what we called them. Um, I found my introduction to copyright session just terrified everybody and nobody would come to it. So I never uh, run workshops um, with those sorts of titles anymore. But also, we tried to run sessions sometimes in new areas. So we run, ran a session about Facebook and how to use Facebook effectively um, for teaching. And what we kept finding was that many, many of our administrative colleagues came along saying, I'm setting up Facebook pages for, um, for students who are new to the LSE, and I want lots of advice about how to use Facebook groups. And, you know, teaching somebody in this kind of area where it's, Facebook's changing every day, as well. You would, you, I remember walking into a, a workshop I was running on this topic and the whole interface of, of Facebook had changed completely. The groups were working in a completely different way. It's, it's really, really challenging. We've also tried um, to, to kind of um, move some of the programs that are more appropriate um, into different streams. So we now have a program that we call Research and Development that focuses on PhD students and, and we've moved quite a number of courses um, into this. But also we realised that sometimes, so the Facebook course we dropped, but Twitter, we were at the point of thinking nobody is interested in Twitter, nobody wants to come on a workshop and I would say there was some sort of tipping point around five years ago when suddenly this became the workshop. It's now now, um, probably the most popular session we do every term, along with writing for blogs, kind of at the point where I thought, blogs, is, you know, are people using blogs? Are they interested? You know, so I think sometimes patience kind of pays off as well. 
Um, and I think it's um, also about just constantly refreshing what you're doing, looking for innovative ideas, looking to transform your teaching. Um, this, uh, I, I give out fortune cookies for pe to people for, um, with copyright messages embedded inside them <laughs> and, uh, and cakes as well if they'll come on a, a workshop. But I now teach copyright in a very interactive workshop style um, using actually a, a game um, that involves cards. It doesn't involve technology at all. Um, but it is in our digital literacy program. I guess we've kind of gone post-digital with the card games. Um, I think the other thing that has been working incredibly well, I mentioned a lot of the programs we run aimed at staff, but we've started working on a program for students and working with them as partners to really understand what it is that they need and to run workshops that support them, um, but to, to do, run those workshops in a collaborative way. So they're taught in a very, very different way from a formal sort of teaching session. They're very discursive. It's asking students about what tools and technologies that they're using and it's encouraging students to provide peer support for each other um, and for um, other students within their department and, and this it's sort of bottom-up approach has been far more effective at my institution um, than trying to, to kind of go from the top and develop a framework and work downwards that's not to say that I think we, we obviously do need a strategy we have a, a, a digital and information literacy strategy but um, having sort of guidance from GISC, from the HEA, from um, the, the QAA with the review they did, which was focusing on digital literacy, has all been useful things to point to. Um, for my um, own institution, I have to say, they, they're very much an institution that, that, that doesn't like to be told what to do from the top. So, so strategy is only going to get us so far. I think one of the things is it's really key to me that were I to leave the, the LSE tomorrow that the digital literacy program would continue because I've made it sustainable by bringing in a, a wide range of staff to teach on that program and to kind of um, to get it so that it, it, it is something that people see has a benefit. So we've tried to do quite a lot of work um, to gather evidence that it makes a difference, that it's making a, an impact and that's kind of you know, going beyond just sort of giving out evaluation sheets at the end so that the people that come to your courses are all saying, yeah, they're great, they're great. It's trying to reach other people as well and to work out why they're not coming on your programs and what, what sort of areas they want to develop their digital literacies in. Um, but I think there's also one of the most important things is communication and collaboration and trying to avoid duplicating efforts, so working with your colleagues in all different departments to understand what they do and kind of how the, the jigsaw fits together. So we uh, together can hopefully assemble this team of superheroes who are all going to be kind of working together. But I, I think um, rather than seeing um, it as a kind of a group of people that are all heading in the same direction, um, but maybe having their own uh, agendas, I like the idea that we're complementing each other, that there may be places where we're overlapping and that we're quite happy with that. We're quite comfortable with the overlaps as well and that we're prepared to work together in those spaces so that um, our staff and our students actually get the digital literacies that they need. So I'm going to leave it there and um, I've got quite a number of further readings at the end. If you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter, you can have a look at my blog and hopefully got a minute or so for questions. A couple of minutes. Three minutes. Well, I've got a question to start. Um, if you can't call a course Introduction to Copyright, what do you call it? Uh, well, we actually, to be completely honest, I have, I've, I've, I've started calling it a workshop and I do call it um, kind of something about understanding copyright licenses and exceptions or something like that. So it probably sounds worse, if, in all honesty, than it, than it did. But my, the key message actually for that session is that the word has got out that that is a fun session and that's why people want to come on that. So in that instance, that is yeah. more about what you put in the description and telling people that it's kind of a games-based learning session and, and things with, like that. With fortune cookies. With yeah. fortune cookies yeah. and cake, yes. But, I, I, yeah, I mean, there are many other workshops where we touch on copyright yeah. and it isn't mentioned in the title at all. So finding and using digital media, for example. Yeah. Any other questions? In that case, I want to ask another one. And there is one at the back from, sorry, from Sarah. 
I'll let Ian get over there, but my quick question was for really both for you and Sue, which is that you've got student ambassadors, and so the idea is that they would work with staff, and I just wondered how, um, how keen staff who are perhaps digitally reluctant are on having students telling them how to do things better. I, I think that de depends a lot on the, the individuals and depends a little bit um, on the discipline. So Sue mentioned that in some disciplines where it's really not seen as something that you need to engage with, I think staff would be much more reluctant. I've, I've got incredible buy-in from our statistics department, so I spent quite a lot of time talking to them about why digital literacy matters for statistics students, and it was quite clear that actually it's a very integral part of the discipline to, to kind of deal with numbers, to, to know how to use Excel effectively, but kind of to, to also use um, data and, and, and kind of being able to find data sources. So it, I think it really does vary on the staff. I don't know if Sue's got anything to add. Yeah. It's individual Sue's response that we've got a bit of a feedback issue going here. Um, I think Sarah's got a question at the back. Yes, thank you, Jenna. I really enjoyed your, your presentation. Um, just a question really from the students you're working with in, in terms of the skills that they are developing. Are you, have you been able to sort of gather um, and share sort of the benefits that they are realising from the involvement? Because I'd imagine that they are getting a lot out of the activity as well. Yeah. Yes, we've, I think it's on my um, slides at the end. So we have got a couple of, um, from our um, Saddle project, the Saddle blog, we've got quite a number of evaluation reports that we've done in the last couple of years because this will be the fourth year um, starting in October that we'll have run this program and every year we have spent a lot of time capturing the student voice, capturing what it is that they've got out of it. Um, we didn't want to push this as a program that would help with employability but that is one of the key messages that has come across but what's quite interesting is that many of the students don't necessarily talk about the digital skills they've developed through the program. They talk about the skills that they've developed through working in groups, through uh, working kind of with staff in a partnership way. So it's kind of all about the, the softer skills, the communication skills they've developed, um, the, the, the skills to sort of um, to act as a, a kind of mentor and, and leadership, leadership skills, I think, are one of the really key things. And students have actually used the word about it, the programme being empowering. Um, and, but I think it's, it's not just the technology sort of side of it. It is sort of being able to show others how to do something better. Um, that, and they say that it's useful when they go for job interviews, this kind of thing. So... Yeah, lot, we have got lots of evidence and we're going to hopefully get lots more this year because we'll be doing a, another evaluation study and using the visitors and residents as a kind of typology to, to look at where our students sit. Okay, so well.